Am Hi. I audible? Good afternoon. Sir, am I audible? Sir, am I audible? I can hear loud and clear. Yes, of course, you're audible. Okay. So, a very good afternoon to the esteemed guest of the day, to our respected teachers and my beloved friends. Today, we have among us one of the most eminent and esteemed figurehead, Mr. Gautam Hazari, sir. The topic for the discussion today would be on navigating disruptions, a future roadmap. But before we begin with, I would like to take the onus of introducing about sir to you all. Mr. Gautam Hazari, sir, is a technical director at GSMA London, United Kingdom. He is an insightful, strategically driven technology leader with over 20 years of robust experience in the IT and telecom sectors across delivering technology strategy, architecture, and design for complex global programs and projects on time and within budget. He has been communicating solution strategy while facilitating strategic inputs and visions for implementing new innovative technologies to the key stakeholders. He also holds a distinction of developing and designing innovative ideas, business IT alignment policy and change management within organization imposed due to technology projects. He has also been leading and delivering large scale distributed systems in digital identity, network capability exposure, payment solution with in-depth understanding of cutting edge technologies and the applications in blockchain ledgers and AI in complex systems. He also holds various patents and invented standards for the telecom industry and also have published many articles on innovation. So I Kaushiki Basu of PGDM Batch 2022, welcome you sir on behalf of ITS Parivar and also on my personal behalf to this virtual session put up by ITS Gaziabad. Your presence today is ecstatic for all of us. So now sir, the platform is all yours and you can begin with. Over to you sir. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for uh, for inviting me and for those kind words. Uh, am I am I audible perfectly? Is my audio okay? Yes, sir. Can you... Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, great. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, can I share some slides? I've got a few slides so that you know uh, it becomes much more easier. Okay, great. Can someone confirm if you can see the slide? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, thanks a lot for uh, inviting me. And uh, what I would like to uh, talk today is, as you know, about the disruptions. <laughs> and um, I'll try to uh, share my experience I, 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 as I have uh, seen through. Uh, the disruptions. I have been working mostly in the telecom industry, but I started uh, uh, from the financial industry. Um, and uh, when working in the telecom industry as well, I have been working with uh, the internet industry as well, and uh, many of the other uh, industry players. So there is some very interesting things happening right now. And uh, I know there are lots of confusions around disruptions as well. So today, what I'd like to uh, talk through is um, um, to talk generally about disruption. I'll try to uh, talk through some of the myths about disruptions um, and also uh, how we can actually use disruption as a strategic tool because that's probably most important. Uh, as we all know, we are going through and what I call accelerated disruption. So it's not just disruption, it has accelerated immensely and for a reason. And it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing and it's a tool. Um, and uh, it's not uh, completely to do with technology. And that's uh, probably one of the biggest uh, kind of misconception. Uh, so uh, let me just talk through that, okay? I'll tell you a few of the, uh, kind of interesting disruptive uh, stories as well. And being from the telecom industry, I'll talk about um, what's happening within the telecom industry. There's a lot going on within the telecom industry from disruption perspective. And also I'll share my thoughts on uh, how to actually go through this, how to actually navigate through the disruption. 
So uh, let's start with uh, where we are right now. We are in a very, very different um, world right now, as we all know. Um, so, uh, and again, a uh, few of the things that we see in the slide, uh, they are just some of the selected ones. Uh, there are many, many more. Um, when I say many, it's uh, in the tens of thousands of these things and coming up almost on a monthly, if not weekly basis. Um, and I'm sure you have you have heard these phrases uh, earlier as well in you know almost in every platform where I go to I hear the same story. So um, and it's 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 a very strange uh, world right now. So uh, the traditional boundaries are getting broken. So um, if you say uh, Facebook they are the largest and most popular media owner right now. Uh, and to the extent that we talk about fake stories and everything else. But the important thing is they are the largest media owner right now, but they don't create content. So that changes the concept of uh, the media industry. Uh, similarly, for Alibaba, they are the most valuable retailer, as we know. And then they are getting into all sorts of other businesses as well, including infrastructure and also uh, innovative uh, payment mechanisms. But they don't believe in inventory. That's not where they started, uh, but they are the retailer. So the retail industry is getting changed. I'll not yet use the word disruption. Uh, Uber, we all know, they actually transformed the vehicle uh, renting business, but they don't believe in owning vehicles. They do own vehicles, a uh, few of those, but they don't believe in that. And they are not just transforming uh, the vehicle industry on the road, as you may know, they are trying to um, transform uh, the next generation of uh, vehicle industry. So flying cars, for example, and the one where uh, you know, it, it's impacting mostly my industry, is the largest communication provider uh, is actually WhatsApp right now. And uh, they don't own uh, any telecom spectrum. They don't have telecom license. And that's, that's strange. And that has got severe impacts. Uh, you may know that uh, WhatsApp, uh, they have around 2 billion active users. Uh, none of the largest of the telecom operators cannot even think. Um, so the largest telecom operator from user-based perspective is uh, China Telecom. They have around uh, just over 500 million uh, user base. So they are not there yet, not even at the 25% of that. So anyway, so the world that we live in is very different and all the traditional definitions of the industries are uh, changing. So as we need to talk about disruption, um, so let's see, let's try to see what disruption is because it's a very overloaded term. Uh, we use disruption alongside many things, sometimes negative, sometimes, you know, um, to mention completely different things. Uh, but mostly we use disruption in a negative sense. And uh, the Oxford de dictionary definition of uh, disruption is, uh, is exactly that. So it's talk about uh, a problem uh, which actually is interrupting an ongoing event or an ongoing activity or a process. So there is an inherent and implicit negativity to this uh, statement. And uh, you may have heard the term disruption in the context of uh, many other uh, activities that's going on. I have heard disruption, um, a, a synonym used as Uberization uh, on disruption. And then when someone uses that term, they use it in a negative sense that this is killing the industry. But when we talk about disruption, we actually talk about disruptive innovation or in the business context. It's not that dictionary definition that we actually use when we talk about disruption or at least when I am talking about disruption. So this, now, this term disruptive innovation was uh, first used by uh, Christensen. So Christensen uh, was a... a very famous businessman from from the US and he was a 
Harvard professor as well. So he published an article in HBR in the Harvard uh, Business Review in 95, and he called it the disruptive technologies. Uh, and then there he used the term disruptive innovation and it caught the imagination that become a buzzword of that time. Everyone started to use those uh, in their talks, uh, in their, in their uh, conference uh, speeches and so on. So then he followed up two years later with his friend um, to publish this book, The Innovative Dilemma. Uh, you may have come across that. This is one of the most brilliant book uh, on innovation, uh, very thought provoking. Uh, if you have not gone through, I would uh, recommend that um, you uh, go through this. This is an amazing book. Uh, interestingly, Christensen had uh, an Indian connection as well. He worked for TCS actually, uh, briefly. He was uh, on the board of directors for TCS. He died uh, almost exactly one year back. So 23rd of uh, January, if I remember correctly, last year, uh, he died. But he actually uh, created um, this um, this uh, uh, thought that we were, we are going through to talk about uh, disruptive innovation and in general the term disruption and in a business sense, not necessarily in a negative sense, but in a business sense. Although Christensen, uh, when he published the book Innovator's Dilemma, he actually uh, kind of narrowed down the scope of uh, disruption. What does that mean is uh, he actually gave some examples uh, in the book to uh, explain himself that when he talks about disruption, he talks about a kind of uh, independent disruption, not uh, continuous disruption. So for example, um, in from his definition, Uber is not a disruption because Uber didn't create the transport industry. It changed the way the transport uh, or rather uh, the transport hiring industry works. So from his definition, it's really not uh, uh, a, a disruption. Uh, for him, disruption is like when, for example, a radio or television came up, it actually created or transformed completely the entertainment industry. Although um, we don't really uh, narrow down uh, the definition of disruption. Uh, and uh, personally, I also don't uh, want to narrow down um, the, the disruption and put that in a container. Uh, so I treat or I will treat Uber, Airbnb, all those as a uh, disruption because they are changing the uh, industry. And, um, you know, in the business context, it makes sense to not put that in a container. And I'll talk about that, why I say so. And uh, I was talking about this acceleration of disruption. Uh, it is accelerated. And if you see, I mean, this is, uh, this I took from uh, Wikipedia, you may have seen much more kind of dramatic graphs there. So this actually plots the, the world average GDP per capita. And there is something very interesting started to happen just after 1800. But from the 2000, the graph, uh, you know, is almost unrecognizable. If you, so this is at the long scale. If you kind of compress this thing, there are much more dramatic uh, charts, as I said. You will see uh, not really a hockey stick, a complete uh, reverse L type graph, where you will see a flat line till 2000, and there is a strong upward uh, lift um, uh, creating a reverse L. So um, it's, it's extremely, you know, kind of uh, significant in the world we are living in, because the um, average GDP per capita actually indicates uh, what's going on uh, especially in business and in the industry. So what actually happened? Uh, because uh, mankind is not new, right? Um, so intelligent mankind has been there for at least 400 million years. So what has happened in the last 100, uh, 200 years, or more important in the last 20 years? So what's going on? So if you actually compare this thing with the uh, industrial uh, revolution, it started at around uh, the start of the 18th century, 1760 to be precise, and until uh, the start of the 19th century, around 1840, 1850. That's where the industry, the first industrial revolution uh, was going on. So that almost coincides with that. So 
you know this acceleration that we see in the in the uh, average gdp uh, per capita in the world actually coincides with that and this then is, we uh, can extrapolate sir sir so uh, so if you could switch on your camera sir that would be great sir actually we were taking photographs of the event i'm sorry let me thank you so much sir thank you sir okay so um that uh, you know that event uh, is extremely significant uh, because you know if we can relate um, the industrial revolution with uh, what started to happen just after uh, the 18th century 19th century then we can extrapolate that and then we can you know we talk about uh, the industrial revolution that is going on through artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning so that actually explains the type of um, type of acceleration that we are seeing now and uh, you must have seen this thing so these are getting very very popular these days so since 2015 every year uh, someone publishes what we call the internet minute so um the acceleration is gone to uh be that we don't even wait for the year to complete to talk about what has happened so we talk about what's happening in the internet in a minute so um i mean it's interesting that it's a combination of our um, old habits i would say and the new mechanism uh, are all here so when i say old habits it's like emails uh i mean you know i have heard in 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 many platforms that emails are uh, talked about as uh, old generation same as text but still they're there so the maximum number of things that are even that happen in a in a second in a sorry in a in a minute in 60 seconds is actually emails so there are around 190 uh, million emails are sent in uh um in a minute uh, just to be fair that majority of those are actually automated emails so they are emails sent by businesses uh to individuals and at the same time as expected we can see that messages through whatsapp or through other mechanisms are around 60 million messages are sent so i mean the point here is the world is at an extremely accelerated pace and um, it's creating a lot of um stress on businesses through the disruptions which are uh, getting uh, brought in i have yet not defined what a disruption is from you know that we should take into consideration we will do that later but to start with as i mentioned earlier let's go through some of the myths um and um, let's let's talk about why i call those as myths so i'll talk about five of the myths that i think are um that creates confusion and that actually shades or tries to shade uh, the concept of disruption um in a negative way which it shouldn't be uh, it's much more positive than how it is painted right now and then the first most common one is that disruption is actually done by technical uh, inventions and um actually uh, just to be fair there are lots and lots of examples that you see um in the industry and not just from now from the industrial revolution the first industrial revolution uh by the end of the 18th century start of 19th century um that actually uh, kind of indicate that disruption is done by technical invention but i'll talk through some of the stories um the first story about um that myth that invention is caused by uh, technical invention is uh, actually about kodak Uh, we all heard about the kodak moment uh, by the way kodak uh, was not a, a japanese company or a korean company i have heard that uh, in you know in, in some uh, places as well that people talk about kodak being a japanese or a korean company kodak was an american company it was actually called the eastman kodak uh, set up by mr eastman so the story here is um, kodak was uh, the market leader of the film camera system uh, so when i moved to um 
in UK in 2000, that was the only mechanism for me to take uh, films. And when you move into a new country, you, know, you take lots of pictures. So Kodak was my, you know, was my friend. But then something happened, right? So they had to, I mean, that something or that disruption that happened in that industry actually killed that company. And then they had to file bankruptcy in 2012, okay? And uh, you, will, um, you will hear that that disruption was caused by a technical uh, invention of a digital camera. So people started to use a digital camera and not films and Kodak was uh, mostly based on films. So that killed the industry. And uh, this guy, Steve Sasson, uh, he's kind of uh, uh, blamed that he invented the digital camera and uh, that killed the, uh, the, the film industry and Kodak. The interesting thing is Steve Sasson was actually a Kodak employee. Kodak invented digital camera. So the technical invention, which the company did actually killed them. And um, just to add on that is Steve actually invented the digital camera in 1975, a while, while back. One of the good thing that Kodak did was they patented it because at that time there were you know everything that you invent was getting patented maybe the senior management was not even aware uh, of that and steve uh, was an electrical engineer uh, at that time uh, from new york and he presented his invention to the board to the management board and um, the kodak management actually laughed at him so uh, there's a famous quote um, that Steve mentioned in one of the conferences is that the management said that it's cute, but don't tell that to anyone. Why? Because it doesn't use the film. So here, the problem was not the technical invention. The problem was a business decision to look um, to keep a blind eye to the disruption and still keep your uh, business model based on films, which was getting faded away. And that killed that uh, company and also the industry. The next uh, myth is about a consistency of uh, disruption, that uh, disruption needs to be consistent. So when something is disrupted, you keep doing the same thing consistently so that you get a maximum business value. Um, let me tell you the story of uh, Netflix. Netflix um, was not created as a business as we see it now. So today, you know, uh, Netflix is absolutely massive. So um, overall around the world, 15% uh, of the overall internet traffic actually goes through uh, Netflix. And it's absolutely, uh, you know, um, massive. Um, I was, um, when in my, in my previous life, when I was working with the Water Food Group, we were doing uh, some interesting thing with them. And we saw the amount of traffic that they were having. It's just immense. But interestingly, um, they have not been consistent. So we know that Netflix disrupted um, the, some of the industries, not just one. The most important one is the cable industry. So the cable industry is almost gone in some of the countries. In the US, there is no cable uh, industry. Everyone uses Netflix and it's getting uh, replaced in uh, many of the other countries as well, in Europe, in the UK as well. And the same uh, disruption is happening even in India as we, as we see. So um, the way it was started was in, when it was started as a company in 1997, it was started as a DVD and video cassette uh, renting online site. So before that, there was a company called Blockbuster. Um, so Blockbuster had the brick and mortar shops where you can go and then you can rent the uh, video cassettes or uh, DVDs from that shop. You take it home and then you have a fixed uh, time for a week or two weeks. After a week or two weeks, you come back and then you uh, give back the video cassette or the DVD. 
and then you get and if you want you take the next one and if you don't return it uh, in the shop on time then you get fined okay so these two guys uh, hastings and mark uh, they thought that it's 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 a bit inconvenient right you need to walk to the shop and you may not have the brick and mortar shop um, in every neighborhood so uh, it's inconvenient to uh, travel to the nearest uh, blockbuster and then rent it why can't we actually use um, a, a postal system where you can order online the dvd or the uh, are done you just you know put it in a in a in a packet and then the the courier or the post takes it back so that's how they started so their idea was of course a small disruption but to uh, basically um, use the inconvenience uh, of traveling that's where they started and um, both these guys uh, um, hastings and mark they were not really product guys they were investors and uh, technical guys so they, they didn't have any kind of emotion with the product so uh, interestingly uh, after you know few years so in 2000 they thought that you know okay their business has grown a bit uh, further so they wanted to kind of exit from that business because they were not really product guys there was no emotional connection as i said so they went to a blockbuster so um, read uh, then uh, got an appointment with the ceo of blockbuster and, and offered that okay do you want to do partnership so that we can do it uh, together and um, also offered that okay do you want to buy it uh, at 50 million uh, us dollars so the ceo of blockbuster actually laughed at them and uh, then it, it, you know we know that it's it's basically uh, is a history that Blockbuster um, filed for bankruptcy in 2010. So it killed uh, that company, the you know the market leader, and also killed that industry of, um, of of renting DVDs. But most importantly, here as we were talking about consistency, Netflix very soon realized that they don't need to do or continue with the business that they started with. In 2000, and they tried out so many things in between. They tried out a subscription model, all-you-can-eat model, and so on. Okay. In 2007, they tried out streaming, but they were very careful. So uh, the company said that they still believe that DVDs are going to you know, continue with, but they want to try out streaming as a, a separate service, included as part of the subscription. But then the rest is uh, history, right? So they didn't continue with what they were doing. They stopped every other business, and then they continued with, continued, uh, with the streaming business, which created a new industry, disrupted the old industry, killed the old industry, and um, then created so many new other participants as well. The third one is disruptions, or the third myth rather, is um, disruptions are one-off events. It just happens, then it waits for the next disruption to happen. The reality is it's not. It's a continuous thing. It keeps happening. And I'll go back to you know uh, the two stories that I talked about. The, the first one was about Kodak, which got disrupted uh, through their own invention, which was the digital camera. And now we can see that the story continues. So the digital camera is now getting uh, disrupted with uh, the camera that we have on uh, our phones. So the cameras that we get um, integrated with our phones are so sophisticated. There is no need for a digital camera to be used as a separate gadget. So uh, in my uh, iPhone right now, in the 12 uh, Pro, the camera is no different to the DSLR camera um, that I used to use a um, few years back. I mean, you can do almost everything that you can do in a DSLR, uh, including manual shoot, raw shoot, and so on. So um, the disruption which started uh, with the digital uh, camera, which uh, killed one of the industry, the film industry, and the largest company, Kodak, it's getting disrupted uh, again uh, on its own. So it's continuing. Same with Netflix. Netflix uh, disrupted the DVD rental uh, industry 
and created a new industry of uh, streaming, streaming uh, TV shows, streaming videos, a new form of entertainment, consumption of entertainment um, uh, content. Now, there are you know, huge competitors. So we have Amazon Prime, Disney Plus, uh, Apple TV Plus, and so on. There are so many other local ones as well. I know in India, you have got so many other local ones as well, Hotstar and so on. And it's actually disrupting uh, the company on its own. So I have uh, a chart from Statista. It's a bit small to uh, see probably. But in India, what I uh, figured out is uh, Netflix and Amazon Prime are on you know, head to head right now. So they both have got 20% market share. In other uh, places, um, it's not exactly the same. Netflix is still the leader, but it's getting disrupted for you know, uh, I mean, without any doubt. So uh, it's a continuous process. It's not one off event. So we shouldn't be, uh, you know, one disruption has happened. We shouldn't be thinking that, okay, let's wait until the next one happens. The fourth one is that disruptions propagate easily. So when disruptions happen that, you know, okay, so then it will just uh, get into the industry. It will kill one industry and then everyone will accept it. The reality is, that resistance is a, is a business reaction. It will always happen. And then the problem is, um, you know, many of the resistance will not be known um, by everyone. Uh, I'll talk about that, what I mean. So these are some of the, you know, uh, kind of uh, resistance um, that was seen from the disruption. The, one of the uh, most famous one is about uh, IBM. Uh, the largest, you know, uh, computer company right now. Um, the um, the uh, the president of IBM, who was the son of the owner at that time, uh, Watson Jr. He basically said apparently that uh, there are only five uh, computers that can be sold. Although IBM disputed, or still they dispute that. Um, comment that it was actually meant for a different uh, context. So uh, as per IBM, it was meant for the shareholders to talk about a very specific type of computer, which is not general purpose. But anyways, even if it is for a specific computer, um, the owner and the president of the largest computer company uh, ever, if they're talking about um, that, you know, the computers uh, cannot be sold, um, is a resistance. Uh, similarly, Sir William Price. So Sir William Price was the chief engineer at the British Post. So when the telephone was invented, uh, his famous message was, it's not needed. So there was a natural resistance. He tried to resist uh, the introduction of uh, telephony, telegram in the British soil. And interestingly, uh, Sir William Price actually uh, started all the uh, telephony uh, infrastructure projects within Britain after that, around uh, 19, um, after 1979, around 18, uh, sorry, in, uh, sorry, after 1879, around 1892. And also, uh, 49 Force, um, he was the supreme commander of the Allied Post during World War I. When, um, he heard about airplanes being used by Americans. His resistance was that, oh, this is fine, but this is this is not for military use. Uh, but then we know that the World War was the biggest catalyst uh, towards airplanes being used for military use and so on. So um, disruptions don't propagate that easily. But these are famous quotes that we see, right? There are lots of resistance that happens within the industry that we don't hear because you know they get suppressed. And also within a single organization as well, there are lots and lots of resistance happens due to you know, many things, due to uh, our natural reaction of our uh, existence as well. Uh, so for example, um, when iPods were invented by Apple, they were a big, big hit, you know, uh, that actually created uh, a big stir in the music industry because then you, uh, you could actually buy a single song at 99 cents or 99 cents. But then in 2007, something happened. Apple disrupted themselves. 
So they then launched iPhone, which had the iPod, iPod part of the music uh, streaming receiving service in there as well. So if you think it from the revenue perspective, it actually, the introduction of iPhone in 2007 created a big problem for iPod. So it actually created a 350 million uh, US dollars loss for the iPod industry, which was owned by Apple as well. And although you know iPhone created uh, tens of billions of dollars of additional revenue, but now if you think what could have happened, which you will never hear because you know Apple will never tell you or no one will tell you for obvious reasons, what would have happened within the within the uh, organization on its own? There was a huge department, huge organization within Apple who were working on iPod. They were humans, okay? They were contractors, they were managers, they were directors. Um, they all would have resisted that disruption to the iPhone for their own existence. Uh, but you know that, that happened. None of the disruption, whether it is within the organization, within the industry, or across industry, they don't propagate that easily. There will be resistance. And then the last uh, myth I want to talk about is um, that uh, you know, we, we think that disruption is to start with a ground shaking uh, you know, appearance. Everyone will start to talk about that. It has to be really big. The reality is um, generally it doesn't. And one of the you know stories about Airbnb. Um, so uh, it started really, really humble and really, really, really small. Um, and it started as a desperate measure. So these two guys, uh, Chesky and uh, Gabia, they moved from New York uh, to uh, San Francisco and then they didn't have a job. So they wanted to you know, start something new there and then they uh, didn't have uh, a, a job uh, at that time. So they moved in 2007 and they rented an apartment in San Francisco and then they, um, they were actually struggling to pay the rent. And there was an industrial uh, conference going on in October 2007. So they thought there's an opportunity because most of the hotels were uh, pre-booked. So what they thought was they had few, um, I think one or two of airbeds and they bought uh, one more. So they put the airbeds in the same apartment where they were living. And then they uh, put up a website to advertise that, you know, if anyone wants to sleep for the night, they can actually pay $80 and sleep there. And um, uh, interestingly, actually, um, they were not very hopeful for that. So they almost, not almost, they actually forgot to put any uh, contact, how to actually uh, book for that uh, airbed in that apartment. They put up a website, a small advertisement, and then there were no phone number, uh, no way to book uh, in there. Uh, although three of the participants um, from, the industrial uh, conference that was going on in October in 2007, um, they booked it and then they had to actually struggle to book it. And uh, again, there is an uh, Indian connection in there because the first customer that uh, booked for Airbnb was Amol Surve. Uh, he was one of the uh, design students at uh, that time. And um, he actually said later that he had to struggle because there was no phone number or booking link in that website. Uh, it was called airbedandbreakfast.com. So uh, he had to actually Google uh, the name of these two guys. And uh, Gebia was also a designer. He was also attending the same conference. So he found his name and his phone number and contacted him. So they started really, really small. And then it didn't happen overnight. Um, it, they had to actually kill the company and restart again next year in 2008 in, uh, in August. Uh, they had to actually sell cereal, uh, but then it's, um, it's a ground shaking um, uh, disruption that has actually shaken up the accommodation industry. And there are many more uh, new such uh, uh, companies that have come up as we know. So, uh, I mean, there are many more myths that uh, goes on. So all we need to do is we just need to be careful uh, when we start to think about disruption. 
and uh, there are many others that you know disruptions come from one direction it's not disruptions come from many directions i'll see one example of uh, artificial intelligence in some time so now let's redefine uh, disruption based on specially on the myth so this is how i define disruption so disruption is a business risk so disruption is a continuous business risk it's not just a technical thing and it's not a one off event and it's continuous and it's a business risk and that makes me happy because it's not really negative and because it's a risk it can be mitigated we can use it as a strategic tool to actually move forward in the business and um, although having saying that the technical inventions or whatever happens in uh, the technology sector that do catalyze the disruption so this is the gartner hype cycle for uh, last year 2020 uh, for this year it has not come out yet so in june it will come out so here you will see that this actually gives us some uh, direction some path where it is uh, where it is going uh, towards so you can see and then interestingly many of the things that we see here are actually related to uh, ai and ml the artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning because you know that's one of the disruption or one of the catalysts towards disruption that is not just changing or disrupting uh, one industry so it's actually uh, kind of disrupting every industry that we can actually think of and i'll talk a bit more about that because that's important that we realize what's going on so i just picked up uh, from that uh, gartner hype cycle uh, some of the catalysts um, from the technology sector which are um, which are indicating the disruption so from 5g to quantum cryptography to brain machine interfaces um, ai machine learning of course the smart home industry and uh, ar vr and so on and uh, as i as i mentioned so what's going on in um, or what uh, getting through the catalyst of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning is a multi dimensional uh, disruption what do i mean by that is it's disrupting almost everything or every industry vertical that we can think uh, of so i i have a few of the examples here so so for example logics so logics is one of the organization um, where there are no lawyers okay so this is a law firm but there are no lawyers so the lawyers are replaced here by an, a machine learning model and they doing they are doing real business so they actually um, do contracts management so legal contracts uh, management but that entire legal contracts management is done through ai and as i said there are no lawyers there so that's basically um, disrupting the the solicitors industry and we know that right we heard that uh, many times um so harbor or they call it talent pitch this is a company which is disrupting the um, hr business so they are an hr uh, partner firm and uh, they basically uh, shortlist or manage um, the um, the recruitment of uh, new hires and then the entire process is managed by uh, a machine learning model so from shortlisting of cvs to uh, creating scores for the interviews even creating interview questions that's done by a machine learning model similarly babylon which um, i'm very fond of because you know i was uh, i was advising uh, a, a startup in the health sector and babylon was one of the competitors so i had to look into a bit more detail so babylon is from uk uh, but they are spreading across the world so babylon is um, it's interestingly started by a gp a general practitioner a doctor uh, but it's trying to disrupt the um, the health industry or the doctors so babylon is basically an ai powered uh, doctor so it's an app and behind that app there is a machine learning model so you can interact with the babylon uh, system uh, almost like how you interact with uh, um, with a doctor 
Um, so it's disrupting that industry. And there are many uh, most as well. One is from India as well, actually, Editanji. It's, uh, it's an editorial um, uh, service, but it's done by, by machine learning models. CrowdStrike is, um, is a cybersecurity firm, but there are no cybersecurity uh, experts. I mean, there are a few cybersecurity experts, but they use machine learning models uh, and so on. But uh, let's um, you know pause a bit and let's um, let's see what's going on. Uh, and again, focusing a bit on the AI because that's very important because that's going to that the disruption is an accelerator space and it will keep on going for uh, many years from now. And because this is disrupting um, the uh, the entire uh, business world. Um, the interesting thing is the AI world is probably uh, one of the um, you know most interesting story about disruption, where the disruption didn't start started in the computer industry, and it has nothing to do with um, you know the algorithms that is used by the AI and uh, the machine learning. It's a story about data. What do I mean by that? Is you know. Um, the basis for all uh, artificial intelligence machine learning model is uh, the Bayes theorem uh, created by Thomas Bayes. Uh, I mean, that's, that's an extremely uh, famous simplistic uh, uh, theorem of probability, which is used by uh, most of the, which is the basis of most of the algorithms. But um, the Bayes theorem was actually created in 1763. So why we are seeing all these, uh, let's say new acceleration right now. Why didn't we see it even in the 18th century or 19th century or even you know, 30, 40 years back? And also um, we talk about all these uh, neural network systems, right? So the first neural network um, was implemented in a small computing machine in 1951, but still we didn't see the type of acceleration that we are seeing. And actually, uh, you know, if you see the timeline, and uh, the chronology of orders, um, the acceleration in AIML has started in the last 10 years, not before that. And why, why that has happened? And it has happened not because of technology, because of someone thinking out of the box and it's due to the data. So, so these two uh, guys, Hubble and Weasel, um, they're two um, neurophysicists. So they actually figured out in cats uh, that they, the cats in their uh, optical cortex, they have something where there are individual neurons which fire off when an optical stimulus comes in. And then they presented a paper uh, that was in 1950s. And then they got the Nobel Prize for that uh, for medicine in 1981. So that was an isolated event that happened in the medical industry. So one of the Japanese computer scientists, uh, Fukushima, then he picked up that medical uh, journal. And then he thought that I can actually write um, an algorithm which can actually use the same mechanism where the neurons got uh, fired off. And then he created uh, one of the convolutional uh, neural network uh, based on uh, that, but again, uh, it was just a research paper, some sort of algorithms that was created. And still nothing uh, really happened. That happened after um, the two uh, guys got uh, Nobel Prize, the two medics got uh, Nobel Prize around 80, 1980. Then what happened was one of the Chinese American uh, computer researcher, not really an AI researcher, computer researcher, Fei uh, Fei Li, he thought, that maybe I need to think somewhere uh, differently. And he started to think of maybe the problem is not algorithms because algorithms has been there for the last uh, you know, 200 years. It's about data. And then let's think it this way, okay? So um, if you think, how do we actually uh, recognize any object that this object is a bulb or this object is a glass or this object is apple? or this object is a cat and not a dog. We do it through our optical um, uh, stimulus and how the brain processes those images. But if you think it you know, from a pure numbers and data perspective, 
a normal human eye um, can actually see images at around 10 frames per second. So which means in one second, 10 images are you know, received and uh, processed. So which means in an hour, it will be around uh, 36,000 images which will be processed, which means in a day, it will be around uh, 860, which means in a year, it will be over um, uh, 3 uh, million. Uh, images which will be processed. So if you think that a uh, small child who is just born, who is looking around the world, and then all sorts of tagging are happening, you know, the parents are pointing towards, hey, this is a book, this is your dad, this is your mom, and this is an apple, this is food, this is not food, don't touch this, don't touch that. So those all images get processed. So in a year, more than 300, more than um, uh, three uh, million, uh, uh, more than 300 million uh, images are getting processed. So after 10 years, the amount of images or amount of data that will be processed in our mind will be huge. So then uh, this, uh, computer researchers fairly thought maybe that's what I had to look into. So then he talked with one of the linguists uh, from Princeton University who was working on a project called WordNet where he was collecting all sorts of words. And then he thought that, okay, maybe we need to get lots and lots of image data. And he started a project called ImageNet. And then within that ImageNet, he opened up to you know whoever can basically post an image of a cat or a dog of 20,000 around category, and then they can tag them. So humans were actually tagging that this is a cat from all different angles. And then that ImageNet project actually, uh, which was around in 2006, that triggered the AI revolution. So it's a, it's a story about data. All we were missing in the industry was data. It was not algorithm or you know uh, clever uh, statistical modeling or uh, clever technology. And uh, as we all know, so the amount of data that we are generating is increasing more and more. And that's why I say that the AI industry will progress or disrupt even you know at a at a higher pace. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, so being from the telecom industry, uh, I will share some of the important things um, that are happening to disrupt uh, going outside uh, the telecom uh, industry. So the first one, of course, is 5G. So it's a bit unfortunate that, you know, when we talk about 5G, uh, we start to think about all the other Gs that have happened uh, from 2G, 3G, 4G. Uh, 5G is quite different. 5G is probably the odd one in that all those uh, Gs that we know, uh, because 5G is about uh, moving outside the telecom domain and doing all sorts of other things. So 5G is not just about speed, because we in 4G as well, we have lot, I mean, enough speed. 5G is um, a fight back from the telecom industry to disrupt the other industries. So what do I mean by that is, um, you know, um, the telecom industry has started to think that um, they are actually service providers. I mean, it was told earlier as well that they are service providers, but they were not really working like that. What does that mean is, so for example, in the service industry, if you uh, buy a plane ticket uh, to get, a, you know, a passenger service, there are always uh, different categories of service. So if you buy a ticket for first class or a business class or an economic class, uh, based on uh, you know, what, what you want, uh, you get that type of service. Um, similarly, you can get a you know, preferential uh, service based on you know, if you are a gold customer or a uh, bronze customer or a silver customer. In the telecom industry as well, uh, what was happening was every use case, every vertical, every user was treated exactly the same. So it was a pipe. So if you know, uh, if you need uh, the bandwidth to be X, you are still using the same pipe. If you need uh, a bandwidth to be much higher, then you were using still the same pipe. In 5G, what's happening is there is something called network slicing that's happening. So for example, if um, one of the 5G use cases is doing a remote uh, surgery, in that case, your latency requirement is extremely high. So in that case, you should use a, a slice of the pipe where it is you know, kind of diamond standard. 
but if you are uh, sending an email or a message you don't need that kind of latency so in that case you can use the pipe which is you know not exactly that so that's what is happening uh, in 5g and, and many more as well the other thing that's going on in, from the telecom industry is um, internet of everything it's beyond internet of things uh, because telecom industry uh, the biggest thing that they have is the connectivity and they can connect everything together and uh, make out uh, meaning uh, from there. So they connect things uh, through the IoT, the smart homes, the smart uh, manufacturing, smart um, vehicles and so on. And then they also connect uh, things that the users carry, their mobile phones. So they can be the internet of everything and that's what is going on. Not separating out the IoTs uh, from the mobile phones. The other uh, very interesting thing that's happening from the telecom industry, which is driven by the 5G revolution, is um, getting into the edge computing. What does that mean is, uh, many of the other players, we saw that WhatsApp has disrupted the telecom industry. So WhatsApp, being an internet player, moved into as a telecom provider. So um, the telecom industry is fighting back to move into other industries. So for example, um, in 5G, there are a lot many base stations needed for a technical reason than you know, 4G, because the 5G um, waves, which are called millimeter waves, cannot propagate more than 100 meters. So you need more uh, density of 5G base stations, which are really small, but still you need more. Um, but those base stations uh, actually have got you know lots of different resources which are not used all the time by resources i mean computing resources storage resources so as part of the 5g uh, setup the operators are using those base stations as a cloud source at the edge so by edge i mean closest to you know where you want to use them so the uh, telecom industry through this mechanism. So MEC is a term used for multi-access uh, edge computing, where they're trying to disrupt the cloud industry. So they are going head on uh, with uh, Amazon, with Google Cloud, with uh, Alibaba Cloud, and actually participating or collaborating with them. Mobile identity and personal data management is something that's extremely crucial for the overall digital world. Uh, and um, the, the telecom industry is at the heart of it. Um, so uh, they have a very uh, personal relationship uh, with the user and their identity through the phone number and the SIM card. And this is where they're trying to move out of uh, you know, keeping that identity within their uh, domain and to use it for other things as well. And some of the things we have already started to see, for example, in India, Aadhaar, which is you know, linked to the phone number. And um, so the Aadhaar system is an identity system and it's linked to the phone number where it's a, it's a mobile identity. So they are all getting uh, converged together. And uh, because you know, to get that phone number, you need to go through a KYC process and know your customer process. So that creates a lot of confidence on the overall identity ecosystem. The uh, other important one is what is called as the SAIS or the Secure Access Service Edge, which is an extension to the edge computing or you know, the telecom industry trying to uh, disrupt the cloud computing world. But adding on that is you know, security is always an afterthought. And what this COVID uh, and working from home has taught us is the majority of the things that are happening uh, online. And security is of paramount uh, you know, uh, importance because, because many things are happening online. The bad guys are trying to use this opportunity to uh, break through the security. And security is always an afterthought. So you get cloud computing as a business asset, then you put um, basically security as a separate thing, but that's not convenient for businesses and users. So uh, through this uh, secure access service edge, you get security and the service edge access or your cloud computing resources together. Mobile payment, we have seen the disruptions hugely through all the, um, so it started with what was known as a click to a charge uh, with partnership with Google and the telecom industry. Then it uh, went through a lot of other uh, stages 
through the mobile wallet, and then it's now getting into uh, crypto payments as well, where for crypto payments, you need um, the keys to be stored uh, in a secure place. There is an interesting story going on on the internet about you know one of the developers lost his uh, Bitcoin uh, private key, which, which is around 200 million uh, USD right now, and then he doesn't remember where he uh, or what was his password for the key because he didn't actually manage the keys properly but the mobile industry has been managing the keys very securely and without you know much of the users knowing they do it in the sim so that's where the mobile industry is uh, moving towards to do key management for the crypto industry and also uh, mobile health so uh, mobile health passport where all your health data is stored uh, in the mobile device or in the in the sim securely uh, can actually save the life of uh, when you know when you are on your own and you have some health uh, condition where um, the phone that you carry can carry all the uh, let's say health information. So these are some of the things which are uh, initiated from the telecom industry and going outwards from the telecom industry to disrupt the other industry. Uh, so uh, at the last, what I want to talk about is how do we actually navigate disruption? So I have heard this term surviving disruption. Again, that's, that's a bit negative. We don't need to survive. It's not, we don't need to defend. Uh, so disruption is, as we saw that disruption is a business risk and that's a good news because if it is a risk and it is related to business, it can be mitigated and we can use it as a tool. And uh, this is a simple a five point mitigation, risk mitigation strategy that I say and that I propose. And, uh, and it's pretty simplistic. Um, we need to have the adaptability because uh, through the biggest uh, disruption that we have seen across the industries uh, in the form of artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning and fuel through the data revolution that's going on, we need to be adaptive. So in you know five ten years time, many of the industries will look very different to how uh, it is looking uh, right now. So we need to be adaptable. We should have the we should have the uh, mitigation strategy to how do we actually adapt. If you know the the law industry is getting uh, disrupted through this uh, AI and ML, we need to adapt to um, the you know how how it becomes. So it will open up other doors, but it may actually close down some of the doors. And that, that's not a bad thing because disruption is always continuous, as we saw. The B part of that is uh, we need to be the bridge. What does that mean? Is we need to be collaborative. Always, um, you know, we need to uh, look into the industry that we work on and also to the adjoining industry. Because as we saw in the disruption for AI, we never know where the disruption will come from. Because the AI, uh, the algorithmic disruption actually came from medical industry. And then the data disruption actually came from the language industry through the WordNet uh, project. So we need, to, we need to be the bridge towards all the different industries, not just contained within our industry. And also we need to look for the blue uh, ocean strategy against the red ocean strategy. So blue ocean strategy is look for avenues uh, where it's not a me too. Um, so uh, after Airbnb happened, there are lots of other uh, sites which got set up um, to do the same thing. But many of those not even you know, uh, survived for a year because they tried the red ocean strategy where there are lots of you know sharks already in there. So um, creativity, I mean, if you see uh, the LinkedIn learning portal, this is the top uh, skills that is expected because AI ML uh, can disrupt almost every industry, but what will be needed is uh, creativity. So AI ML can provide answers. But creativity is about asking questions. Uh, AI ML, for now at least, until we have artificial general intelligence, they cannot ask questions, they can provide answers. So this is where probably we humans um, have an age, at least for now, where we can ask questions, and that's about creativity. Um, 
diversity and you know all the examples that we saw uh, showed us that that is extremely important because if that um, that point was used by the Kodak management to diverse their um, um, a business model, not just for film, but for the, but for the uh, electronic camera as well, which they invented. In that case, the story of the world would have been very different. Kodak would uh, still be there as a company. And we saw that this is how uh, Netflix survived because they started from somewhere and then they diversified to every uh, avenue from subscription model, all you can eat, and to streaming. And then they survive. So that's how we can actually mitigate uh, the continuous disruption, and which can come from every side. And most importantly, uh, embracing failures. Um, because failures will happen. And the acceleration that we see right now in all the industries um, where we will have to fail fast. And most of the organizations have started to accept it. And you know, all the methodologies like Agile, they actually talk about that. You do an iterative uh, mechanism of managing things, whether it is product management or uh, finance management, you do things uh, quickly and you accept failure, you learn from the failure and then you move forward. Uh, most of the industries uh, have uh, gone through that. Um, so, uh, you know, about uh, the story of, uh, how um, the Angry Bird thing happened. So they failed uh, 51 times. So this was their 52nd product, which actually succeeded. So they failed quickly and then they moved forward. And uh, this is a thought that I want to uh, leave you all with. Um, so disruption is a wind of change. So when disruptions happen or when a uh, wind of change blows, um, you can build a wall, so being defensive. Like this is why I don't like the word um, surviving uh, disruption. Or you can build a windmill where you navigate through it. You use it as a strategic tool. Uh, so you use the 